And good morning. Thank you very much for making it on this week's Writers and Writers of our Triple Expresso podcast. This is your host, Patrick Greenwood. Thank you again for taking time on this Saturday morning. We are joined today by an incredible writer from Canada. And let me get this correct. Edo Von Belkrum. <laughs> good morning, Edo Potato. How are you this morning? I'm very good, Patrick. Thank you for having me. No, I'm glad to have you. Uh, absolutely just a, <laughs> a huge fan of how long you have been around this industry for quite a long time. Um, you know, you and I had a chance to get caught up a little bit on the pre-meeting as well. So one of the things uh, very interesting about getting started, uh, first and foremost, talk a little bit about, obviously, your your Wolfpack series. You know, you've got different books come out. You've got a series of books that have done. When you first started writing that book, and you mentioned, I was reading in your bio, that Kurt Vonnegut, you know, and, and Ray Bradbury were kind of an influencer. Who, who really were your influencers before you started writing that book series? Well, Kurt Vonnegut was an idea of mine I had when I was in university. I thought, wow, that he's really cool. Mm -hmm. And then I realized I'm never going to be able to write like that. So forget that. Ray Bradbury is absolutely mm -hmm. the biggest inspiration. Mm -hmm. He, uh, I read his uh, collection, The October Country. Mm -hmm. 20 short stories, fantastic short stories. Loved every one of them. That's And when I finished the book, that was the kind of writer I wanted to be, to write short stories that people just – finished and said, wow, that was fantastic. And I did achieve that in my first collection, Death Drives a Semi, 20 short stories. Mm -hmm. Stoker Award winner is in there, uh, Stoker finalist, some other uh, top-notch uh, stories. So I did achieve that. Okay. Now you're asking about writing a wolf pack. Mm -hmm. uh, I had been doing all kinds of adult books, mm -hmm. Street Queen, Blood Road, Martyrs, Keith, these kind of things. And mm -hmm. Every time you finish one of these books, think, oh, that's the one. This is the one that's going to really punch through and it's going to be great. Mm -hmm. And, you know, for whatever reason, it doesn't happen. So my wife was a children's librarian at the time. Mm -hmm. She said, you should be writing young adult fiction. Mm -hmm. And uh, so I started by doing um, editing some anthologies for Tundra Books. The first mm -hmm. one was called Be Afraid. Mm -hmm. and the idea was there was going to be horror stories about teenagers and the horror part would be about teenage problems mm -hmm. and it was very well recepted received uh, sorry mm -hmm. and um i did a sequel be very afraid mm -hmm. which didn't have the cachet of the first one some of the, the little bit lesser uh, known writers mm -hmm. and it did it well enough but i proposed a third anthology called shit your pants mm -hmm. because that's all that comes after <laughs> be afraid and be very afraid what else to do is shit your pants right it wasn't going anywhere, so, okay, I'm going to write a full novel. Mm -hmm. And the idea was I'm going to write about teenage werewolves who have all the problems of teenagers mm -hmm. plus they're werewolves. They have this big secret. They have to keep quiet and to themselves, and they, it's always lurking over them. Like they can't divulge who they are, be, mm -hmm. and, you know, so they might be bullied. This mm -hmm. is the, the book, which is a YA book the television series that it was adapted to into mm -hmm. adults and it's a different age group. Mm -hmm. But in the book, they're bullied. They have to deal with it. They can't use their werewolf abilities because that would give up the, the secret. Mm -hmm. And uh, so it started with that. And I had a great opening scene to start it all off. And it went from there, managed to get four books in the series. Mm -hmm. First book was a, Silver Birch Award winner, which did wonders for sales. Mm -hmm. It was the bestseller for the publisher of that year. Mm -hmm. The other books kind of trailed off, and we managed to get in four of them. Mm -hmm. Then, miraculously, 16 <laughs> years later or more, mm -hmm. and even 12 years when the books had been out of print for 12 years, mm -hmm. Hollywood came calling, and Jeff Davis thought it was worthwhile to adapt the series into a television mm -hmm. series. Yes. How it came about. And I did see that in your bio. So one of the things that was interesting is you've been around the business a very long time since the 90s when you were a journalist. Has the publishing industry changed since when you first started your first novel writing and first short story writing? Or are you finding that traditional publishing is relative to the same culture or has it changed dramatically in your time? It's tr changed tremendously. When I got started, paperbacks and paperback originals and every publishing house had three or four horror titles a month. And the goal was to get to uh, in paperback, mass market paperback. Mm -hmm. And it took me a bunch of time to get there. And I did with uh, Pinnacle Books, 
Flood Road and Scream Queen. But by then, the amount of publishers doing horror titles was diminished. Competition yeah. was really tough. And it suddenly became all about sales. So mm -hmm. those two books made it into mass market. Mm -hmm. Now we're asked for sales. Mm -hmm. And the books struggled for one reason or another. Uh, Blood Road really didn't make it into stores, it didn't seem. Mm -hmm. So that was the end of my mass market uh, mm -hmm. career. Uh, in previous generations or previous years, previous decades, mm -hmm. Writers in the mid list could have books that didn't sell very well, and they could power through and, and mm -hmm. like Dean Coots produce them. Yeah, produce them. They produced, and you know, book them. after book and dozens of books, and eventually, by either power of perseverance or sheer will or force or uh, being a juggernaut, mm -hmm. a few <laughs> of the books took off and became bestsellers. And you know, suddenly his backlist is in in high demand and. Mm -hmm. You can do it that way, but I don't think the the opportunity was there in, when I was doing that mm -hmm. for um, for um, a mid list or a sales that, that didn't gen didn't arrive. Mm -hmm. Now you would think mm -hmm. all these years later, twenty twenty two, that with a TV series mm -hmm. on TV starring Sarah Michelle Geller, that it would be a no brainer. Mm -hmm. uh, all four books reprinted in hard copy in a print form. Mm -hmm. Not the case. Mm -hmm. Couldn't find a publisher interested in doing the four books. So really? we we did manage to get the first book reprinted in a in a lesser print on demand format. Yes. Mm -hmm. You can get an Amazon.com anywhere. Mm -hmm. But that's it. The one top the one title in the four. And that so made it are, but that made it to the TV series, correct? Wolfpack did make it on. Well, the, they have the rights to the entire four books. Okay. Like, there's no point in selling them the, the first book, mm -hmm. the rights to, and then no one else is going to buy the other three books. We might as well <laughs> let them have the four, and then maybe they can find something of value in there. But yeah. when that came about, say, oh, look, you mm -hmm. want to reprint the books? It's yeah. going to be a television series. It's going to be on every week. You know, well, it's only eight episodes, but it was weekly. And it was on there, and the response to the TV series was great. But to the print book, mm -hmm. not so much. So how did, how, how did they approach you? And the reason I think that's an, it's an excellent uh, question I ask a lot of the writers that have had a chance to get their stuff on television. How did they approach you about wanting it to be a series? Was it your publisher that had the, the connection, or is it the, them coming to you? or how? Because a lot of people want their stuff on Netflix and Hulu and everything else. How did they approach you and say, hey, we like this, we think there's a miniseries here? How did that kind of come about? Well, this is a story in itself. Mm -hmm. um, when Wolfpack was first published in 2004, there was two people interested in the, the book at the mm -hmm. time. One guy had been an associate producer on the Survivor television series. Oh, okay. Okay, so he's a real guy. He's in television. Mm -hmm. And someone else came around, and they said they had a development deal with Paramount Pictures. Mm -hmm. Wow, that's terrific. But after that initial contact, nothing. Really? Yeah. <laughs> Radio silence. So that's why I've had, you know, books option before, and the time runs out, and nothing happens, and I had this interaction with people on Wolfpack, nothing happened. Mm -hmm. So then, you know, two years ago, I'm sitting at the kitchen table, my wife's making dinner and we're just talking and I get an email. Oh, it's from my agent. Someone's interested in the TV film rights to Wolfpack. Mm -hmm. And I'm thinking, they must be out of their mind because the books are out of print for 12 years. And, you know, the book came out uh, 18, 18 years ago. Mm -hmm. So, okay, we'll entertain that. We're thinking we're the smart ones, right? So, yeah, okay, we negotiated a little bit. And um, it was very impersonal because it came from CBS Viacom. It came from <laughs> no one else that was actually involved with the TV series. And mm -hmm. uh, we said, okay, we'll take your money. Sure, you know, because I expected nothing to happen as it happened before. Right. But to my amazement, you know, six months later, there's a press release saying, oh, the book's in development. And it's still I'm going, yeah, OK, that's great, because <laughs> in development, all kinds of things are in development all the time. 
and, and how and how often your stuff ends up on the editor's floor and the director's well, cuts and all the other things that take away the story and everything. To get option, fine. Option, to get yeah. in development, that's fine too. But actually go into production, mm -hmm. that's, you know, a long shot. So then, you know, another six months later, this teaser trailer comes out from Paramount saying Teen Wolf, the movie is coming back and also in 2022, uh, all new series from jeff davis mm -hmm. wolfpack and then it even said based on the acclaimed book series by edo van belkin mm -hmm. like holy shit this is for real it's gonna <laughs> happen i can't believe it and uh when that uh, teaser trailer came out i watched it for three hours every mm -hmm. time i watch it my name's still there mm -hmm. holy cow it's still there i can't believe it it's still there so very unlikely. You know, the, the backstory is that someone at Paramount, I don't know if it's the same person who approached me in 2004, mm -hmm. <clears throat> went to Jeff Davis and said, would you like to do uh, a, sh a show for us? He said, sure, mm -hmm. something supernatural. He said, okay. They gave him a copy of the book. Mm -hmm. And he goes, oh, no, not Teenage Werewolves again, because he'd just done 100 episodes of Teen Wolf. Right. That had been four years in uh, hiatus. Mm -hmm. But then he read it and he enjoyed the story and there was things in there that he could work with. So he said, yeah, sure. Now, when that happened, Paramount had to get the mm -hmm. rights to it because they didn't have the rights. So that's when they came. And that explains the light speed that mm -hmm. went from option to production. To production, action. right. I, I heard about options where they can come in and they'll buy the option for two years. Yes. But that doesn't mean anything other than that they just want the option to acquire it later in life, but it keeps other suitors sort of away. So it allows yeah. them two years to study. Now, what's really fascinating about what you're talking about is many of the writers that come on this podcast always want to find some way to get into the channels like Netflix or Hulu, whatever, but they don't realize that it could be 20 years before your stuff may even get close to showing oh, up. No. They think you write a book, you think a year later, somebody buys the option, a year later, you're on a six-part series. It's like, it sounds like from what you're describing, it's it could be 15, 16 years. It could be, or never. Is or never. The case. I, when I started talking about this, I used to say that it was like getting struck by lightning and winning the lottery in the very same day. <laughs> but family and friends convinced me that that was selling myself short because the way I would explain it that way is like I had nothing to do with it. Like they picked the, the book out of a hat, right. which isn't the case. Mm -hmm. They decided to do something with it because the, they saw some quality or some, you know, substance in the book that they could work with. So I'm fine with saying I had something to do with it. You know, mm -hmm. it's still lucky to be like winning the lottery, mm -hmm. but it was a lottery that I had a lot of tickets bought for. Right. So, I, it did work out that way. So it's a, it was been, it's been a roller coaster to be sure, you know. But but it's a good one though. It's a it's a good one though. So let oh, I guess one of the okay. things I one of the things I really love about the way you're describing this is that this really really talks to being what a writer really is. It's about persistence, right? Your book doesn't get picked up, your publisher doesn't like it, it gets bad reviews, but you got to keep pushing forward. You got to keep pushing forward. Now, what's interesting about your background which I wanted to touch on is not only did you you know have something get on television, which is fascinating in itself, but you've actually written in different genres. You've actually moved around to different genres. But what's interesting is, like many of us that use a pen name, you've actually changed pen names depending on what you're writing about. So when you were, you, I guess you won an award. I think the Vancouver Post awarded you best erotica novel. I think it was. I think it was one of your pieces you wrote or short stories you wrote. How did you come about? How did you brainstorm and say, you know what, I'm going to take a sidebar and go write this, and I'm going to change my name to this. How did that come about? Well, okay, it's a fair question. I don't get asked that much. They all want to hear about the wolf pack, but this is going way back to right to the beginning. When I was starting, mm -hmm. I uh, wanted to sell stories and publish stories, mm -hmm. and was looking all over the place for markets. And I used to have one of those Writer's Digest uh, fiction writer's market books mm -hmm. that had all the fiction markets Mm -hmm. you could imagine. And they were all in print too, by the way. Mm -hmm. And one of those markets was um, men's magazines. Mm -hmm. Now, in the horror genre, there's a, a history of authors writing for men's magazines and getting published. Mm -hmm. Stephen King did it, although they weren't erotica stories. Or, mm -hmm. And Dean Koontz certainly did his share. Mm -hmm. Robert Silverberg, a science fiction writer, uh, did uh, plenty. He made his living by doing erotica for many, many years. 
Mm -hmm. So I gave that a try and I found some uh, markets that would pay professional rates. I got my uh, membership, an active membership in the Science Fiction and Fantasy Writers of America mm -hmm. by selling three, uh, three titles to Gent Magazine, mm -hmm. home of the D Cup. So, mm -hmm. you know, that's where it was. And it was a professional magazine. Now, the thing was, is where I learned how to write stories mm -hmm. because you can make fun of them all you want. But stories had to have characters, situations, yep, plot. You had to be kind of realistic. You had to have plausible situations and plausible endings. And the structure of the story was a classic story structure. So I did about 50 stories and I learned how to formulate. Them. But mm -hmm. the reason I changed my name is because when I was showing people, hey, I published in this magazine, they were mm -hmm. looking through it because they're, you know. But that's a brand builder, though. I mean, it's sort of a, it's sort of a resource builder in some ways where someone says, what have you done? You well, now have this portfolio that could show different ways of writing as well. They might uh, an editor might nod, uh, nod his head and say, OK, you've done that. You know, right. so but the people were thrilled or amazed that I had been in men's magazines. And when I tried to show them, hey, my first short, real short story publication was reprinted in years best horror stories. Mm -hmm. Yeah, never mind that. Let's look at more of this. And then, OK, maybe I got to change. Mm -hmm. My pseudonym there, give a pseudonym, Evan Hollander. That was the name I used. Right. And then uh, I could separate the two. I did um, I did books in the uh, Deathland series uh, from Harper, uh, Har Harlequin Gold Eagle, mm -hmm. uh, named James Axler. That's called, that's, they technically call that war porn. Mm -hmm. uh, men's action adventure. That was a genre I did. Mm -hmm. I've done mystery. I've done horror, science fiction, fantasy. The only genres I haven't done are um, Western and romance, mm -hmm. and only because no one asked me to. If someone asked me to, I'd give it a try because that's what I was doing. I was writing professionally, trying to sell things, and mm -hmm. I always looked at a new genre as a challenge, you know. Familiar but that's, with that's, but that's good. Genre. And that's very good, though. We're on right now with Edo von ba uh, Belcom. We will be back in just a moment. <laughs> Back on Riders and Riders over Triple Expresso with Patrick Greenwood. We are on with Edo Van Belcom. And Edo, let's talk a little bit about, obviously, Wolfpack itself. Uh, first of all, a big question I want to ask you is, as you were writing it and you were creating it, and it obviously went to print, I noticed you also released an audiobook as well. Are you finding audiobooks are being more successful in selling your books or getting more visibility for books? Or are, are you taking the approach that all books really are not really generating the same revenue that people hope they would get? That's a great question. The answer is, I don't know. <laughs> uh, because the audio book was just a, a recent thing. There was no audio book previously mm -hmm. until the series was announced. So mm -hmm. the series was announced and that generated all kinds of interest. Now, the audiobooks of the Wolfpack series, three are out now. One more is coming in the, the following month. And uh, if you go to Amazon.com and you go to the new releases list for teen and young adult magic realism. Now, how many qualifiers are there, there in that? You know, there's about five of them. So when you have all those qualifiers in there, Wolfpack is the number one bestseller in, on that list. So that's great. The other two books that are out so far are also in the top three or four of that list. Mm -hmm. But then you go into the larger list and it almost vanishes. It becomes number 100 and something. Mm -hmm. So, And it's also, I haven't seen uh, a royalty statement for uh, audiobooks yet. Mm -hmm. But what is the value of saying that you're number one in anything, right? Yes. Hey, I'm a number one bestseller. In what? Well, in the new releases of the teen and young adult <laughs> realism category on Amazon.com. Uh -huh. and, and someone's interested in the books, and I'm grateful for that. 
-hmm. And it's just another way to reach uh, readers. I mean, <clears throat> the audio books are done by a BC uh, actor, narrator, Alan Carlson. Mm -hmm. He does a great job. He's familiar with the area that the books are set in. Mm -hmm. He's Canadian, so he gets all the pronunciations right. Mm -hmm. And it's just great to see all mm -hmm. of these things, the print book, the audio book, mm -hmm. and the e-book, all available at the same time. And in conjunction with the television series, because mm -hmm. if you plug in my name in the television series, mm -hmm. my name has never been on the internet more mm -hmm. than when this series came about, you know, and people mispronounce my name, you know, they get it all wrong, but hey, at least my name's in the game. Mm -hmm. So I'm just thrilled to have the ability to have all of those formats the at the same time, the plus this TV series, having a TV series and all bringing it together as well. Yeah. Have you have you thought about now that the audiobook's out, you got all the mediums out, you've got the television series working. One of the things that I always ask when I have science fiction writers on the podcast is I always talk about brainstorming. Last week I had uh, Edward M. Lerner on, who really was a science fiction writer. However, he came from more of a scientific physics background of working for NASA, right? So his world, when he was brainstorming, was more in that light. How do you brainstorm to come up with these stories? Are you sitting somewhere? Are you cycling? Are you in public? Are you in private? Are you sitting on your couch? Where do you do your brainstorming to say, hey, you know what, that could actually be a pretty good story? How do you, how do you kind of do your brainstorming exercise? Well, when I was writing my most productive period, mm -hmm. I was a school bus driver. Mm -hmm. I've had a million jobs. I got about a dollar for each of them. Uh, and there's no shame in being a writer and having a, a part time job. And that was the greatest part-time job for being a writer because you had money coming in, a small amount of money every week. Mm -hmm. You had uh, runs to do in the morning and the evening and the left six to seven hours during the day to do your work. Mm -hmm. Plus, you had a vehicle to drive so you could stop off on your way or back to pick up things, do any shopping you needed and things like that. And while you're driving, it gave you time to think. Mm -hmm. So I would think in the morning what I'm going to write. And when I had got home, then I started writing. Basically, you know, brainstorming would come all the time. When I was writing full time, mm -hmm. and it was my thing, I would always have paper and pen on me to write down any idea I came to. Because as writers know, if you wake up in the middle of the night and say, that's a great idea in the morning, I'm going to write it down. <laughs> you better write so, it down. Um, <laughs> poof. So even a couple of scribbles on your night table about something you thought of in the middle of the night will remind you and get you back on track. Exactly. So I had a notebook that I would write down all these things and every once in a while I'd go back and find something of value. Mm -hmm. But the, uh, the idea was always to find or think of something that hadn't been written before. Mm -hmm. yeah, there's a common thread that if you can recognize a, a pattern or a style or something that everyone's wanting mm -hmm. by the time you've recognized that it's done because mm -hmm. by the time you write something to fit that mm -hmm. and you try to get it into market it, it they're going to be moving on so always try to think of something different you know same the music industry or, or any other kind of artistic endeavor mm -hmm. they're always looking for something that's different mm -hmm. so with wolfpack maybe uh, you know teenage werewolves mm -hmm. And it's a different kind of a story. It's a family-friendly story. It's mm -hmm. respectful to the, the parents that adopted them. Mm -hmm. They're respectful to the government. They mm -hmm. let the government solve the problem or attempt to solve the problem first. And when all of those things fail, mm -hmm. then they take it upon themselves to mm -hmm. do their thing. So whether that's different or not, but there wasn't you know, terrifying werewolves clawing at the door Mm -hmm. It was a different kind of threat. And the threats came in Wolfpack mm -hmm. book series from the human world. All mm -hmm. the antagonists are human in nature, mm -hmm. not supernatural or anything like that. Jeff mm -hmm. Davis changed the timbre and the, the genre to a family-friendly teen drama mm -hmm. to supernatural mystery. So when you're writing out the way you're doing it, along with brainstorming and translating your brainstorming into writing, do you use the same editor for each book or do you rotate editors? How did the editing kind of come into play when the book is being created? Uh, I had been published by so many different publishing houses. Mm -hmm. I never had a, the same editor more than a couple of times. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, you get, you sell a book to an editor 
and then the book gets out there and then it depends on sales and sales aren't there and that publishing company is not interested in doing more books with you so you're moving on to the next one you got to convince them that no no this is the one you need to publish it's going to sell you a million copies a little selling so I've, never, <laughs> I've never had that luxury of uh, working with a single editor for more than a few uh, books but i must say the editor on the uh, Wolfpack series, uh, at least the first two or three books was mm -hmm. Kathy Lowinger. Mm -hmm. She was the one accepted my uh, idea for the young adult horror anthology, Be Afraid. Mm -hmm. She accepted the Wolfpack proposal over the phone when I told her about the prologue. And here's the opening scene. She says, okay, write that up and send it to me. And she was very enthusiastic. And now she's having a great time watching the success of the, the book series being translated in TV series. Mm -hmm. So she was a one, but I really have not had that luxury of a single mm -hmm. editor over many, many books. Mm -hmm. Well, it's interesting. Now you mentioned publishers and you work through multiple publishers in your timeline. Have publishers ever pressured you or said, Hey, you got to do book signings. You got to show up at the library. You got to do some book clubs. Have they ever kind of put the squeeze and said, look, you got to get out there and kind of promote yourself. Or have you been resistant to that? Um, no, I'm resistant to it now because I've been <laughs> through it before and I know what it entails. Mm -hmm. um, if a publisher says to ask me to do a signing or stand on my head and turn, you know, turn around three times quickly, I'll do it mm -hmm. because uh, I want to be in a good relationship with my publisher. Of course. If they do this signing or appear there, mm -hmm. I will absolutely do it. Um, but I will not seek out bookstore mm -hmm. signings myself anymore mm -hmm. unless you know somebody asks me or wants me to or tells me the parameters of the event and then i'll be there but just to get a book signing in a bookstore mm -hmm. uh, it's a soul crushing experience and i say that from experience i've done it many times and i don't want to do it again so how can people get hold of you what is the best way people can get your books well if you can't find me <laughs> on social media you're not trying hard enough <laughs> I'm on Facebook, Twitter, uh, Instagram. I have a YouTube channel, which is really interesting because there's uh, talks there about how Wolfpack went from book to screen, mm -hmm. if anyone's interested. It's also a reading of me uh, I did of the prologue. Mm -hmm. And there's also goofy stuff that I, when I used to host uh, horror movies on television, on screen TV, mm -hmm. there's uh, crazy stuff there. You can. I'm a lot younger and more handsome, mm -hmm. I must say. But uh, it's a lot of fun there. Some Halloween bumpers for Fox 29 I did and uh, talk show appearances. So that's on YouTube. But all those other platforms I'm trying out. Instagram has uh, Wolfpack Facts is a series I'm trying to get going. Mm -hmm. And it seems to have some traction, not much, but mm -hmm. some. So I'm doing all that. So if you can't find me, you're not looking hard enough. The books are available, Amazon.com. Or you can go to my literary uh, agent's website. That's, I use that as my own. Mm -hmm. Jabberwocky Literary Agency. Go to the author section. Check. Click on V. Mm -hmm. There I am. All the books that are available that I've done are all there. So that's what Excellent. I tell people about. Excellent. Well, Edo Van Belcom, thank you very much for coming on Writers and Writers over Triple Expresso. Thank you again for your wonderful work. I look forward to your next work coming out as well. I'd love to have you back on the podcast again and definitely want to hear more and more what's going on, especially if you get more TV series. That's really fascinating to hear that. The thing right now is we're waiting for uh, episode two to be announced, but it's being uh, stymied by a possible writer's strike from the Writers Guild of America. Mm -hmm. That contract has to be uh, figured out. And then we'll get a season two, but it's on the precipice. Well, love to have you back on. Let's talk I about would it. I'd love to be back on. Anytime you want me, I'm there for you. Thank you, sir, very much as well. And everyone, thank you for joining on this Saturday morning on Writers and Writers over at Triple Expresso. We will definitely see you on next week. This is your host, Patrick Greenwood. Take care. <laughs>